Good morning, Community Life. Today we will be reading from the book of John, chapter 4, and verse 7 through 14. At this time, ushers will be coming down the aisles with Bibles. If you do not have one, or you might know someone that needs one, please take one home today as our gift to you. If you are reading in those Bibles, you can find today's scripture on page 835. Please read with me. A woman from Samaria came to drink water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy, your love. Lord, at this time, we lift up Pastor Matthew to you. We ask that you speak your words through him, that we be edified, built up as a body of Christ, and that if someone amongst us has yet to believe, that they may come to a saving knowledge in the truth and love and be led to that eternal fountain we know as Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, you may have a seat. It's kind of funny. I, I've kind of gotten a little grief because we're preaching the woman at the well a week before Christmas. And somebody told me, Matthew, I think you're supposed to be in Luke chapter one. I think we're supposed to be talking about, you know, Mary and Jesus. And, uh, but I promise there's a reason that we are talking about the woman at the well. You know, this whole Christmas series, we've kind of aligned it with the buzzwords of Christmas. I think when we talk about Christmas, we hear things like love, hope, peace, and joy. And certainly those should be attributed to Christmas. Absolutely, the birth of Jesus does bring those things. And today we're going to be looking at peace. And I just think it's interesting that peace is a word associated with Christmas because this has got to be the least peaceful time on earth if you live in America, particularly if you live in Phoenix. Because if you live in Phoenix, well, the weather's finally nice enough that we can go do stuff. And so now we're, we, got, we set up more plans. Well, then you got parties to go to. you got presents to buy. The stress of coordinating gift giving. Are you buying this for this person or, or, or are we buying it for them? How much do we spend on your aunts and uncles? Do we even like our aunts and uncles? Like you have to ask these questions. And if we're honest, it's just breeding anxiety in us and those around us. Listen, I, I'm a, I think I can confess things here and you probably won't tell anybody. I haven't even put Christmas lights on my house yet. And at this point, it's probably like, well, it's probably not going to happen because it's just gotten so busy. And it seems like the Christmas season in our lives tends to run in opposition to the peace that we desire at Christmas. It seems like our lives are naturally kind of at war with this idea of peace. So I just want to bring us to a simple truth today. So here's my big idea. My big idea is that Jesus brings peace at Christmas. Jesus brings peace at Christmas. And that may seem like, well, Matthew, that doesn't seem like a revolutionary idea. Good. But it's a simple idea that I think that we actually need to spend time dwelling on. It's something that I think we need to look at a little harder. This isn't just a one-time peace that happened 2,000 plus years ago. This is peace this year. Peace today. Jesus offers us that kind of peace. And I would argue that this is what Christmas was all about in the first place. Peace. But to look at real peace at Christmas, I want to go to a story completely removed from the Christmas story and talk about how Jesus provides peace to a real person at a real time in a real situation. Chris did a good job of reading the text for us today. This is a story of Jesus being by himself, which you don't see very often, but Jesus sends his disciples into the town to get food and water and all those things, and, and Jesus goes to this well by himself. 
It's important for the story that we recognize that this is happening in the middle of the day. Uh, much, uh, that region is much like Phoenix. You don't really go anywhere in the middle of the day because it's hot. But this story happens to take place in the middle of the day. Jesus is by the well, and he asks this woman for the well. Let's look at this story real quick. Verse 5. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, and this is not part of the sermon, but I think it's important that when we see things like this in the text that I pointed out to you, Jesus was such a real man, a real man, that he was weary. We think of Jesus sometimes as just this, this God figure, which he is, he is God's son, but he was also a real man. He got tired from time to time. It says he was wearied from his journey. And he was sitting beside the well, and it was the sixth hour. Now, that doesn't mean 6 a.m., it means like midday. And a woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. That sentence actually doesn't do it justice. The Jews and the Samaritans actually despised each other. You could not think of people who were more in opposition to each other than the, these two groups of people. So that brings me to my first point. Jesus offers a peace that is bigger than your present circumstances. Jesus offers us a peace that's bigger than our present circumstances. See, if you were to actually look at the woman at the well's present circumstances, you would actually learn a little more. In fact, as we dive deeper into the story, we're going to find out more about her. But for this woman at the well, her life is encompassed probably by shame. We'll find out later in the story that she's on like her fifth husband, and the guy she's living with now really isn't even her husband. She's had a life that is not one that she probably is super proud of, which is why she's going to the well in the middle of the day. She, has, she can't go with the rest of the ladies because she has too much shame. She doesn't want to be seen with them. She, she's the person that maybe people whisper about in the city. If we were to characterize this woman at the well, we would say, well, she's the wrong kind of person. That she's the person that maybe we wouldn't really associate with, or maybe you really wouldn't talk to, maybe you wouldn't even be friends with. Her current circumstances are anything but peaceful. She's figured out a way to get by in her own shame, and her own guilt, and her own circumstances. And I wonder if you were to look at your present circumstances, I wonder if you would say that they lend themselves to having peace. I wonder when you think about maybe the things that you've done, or the things that have been done to you, or even if you just take this season that we're in, and, and I wonder if I were to ask you, hey, do you feel peace in the middle of this season? I wonder if you would go, Totally. Or I wonder if you'd go, honestly, it's been a week. It's been a month. It's been a season. Maybe it's been a year. But I wonder if you would find yourself kind of relating to this idea that though I'm okay with my circumstances, I've come to terms with my circumstances, I don't have peace. Because even in the things in your present circumstances are fine, even if you feel like, actually, no, I'm doing pretty okay. I think you know well enough that there'll come a time when things won't be okay. There's always a season coming where it's going to be in contrast to peace. It's going to disrupt that peace. And I want to say this, that the thing that you place your trust in now, the, the peace that you tap into now, will determine how you're going to handle the situations that are to come. Let's keep reading what happens. Look at verse 10. So Jesus answered her after her saying, like, how is it that you, a Jew, would ask me for water? Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who, is, who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jacob is this story from the early parts of our Bible. He's a, he's a man, he's, and he's kind of one of the heroes of our faith. He's, if you were to read Hebrews, when they talk about the hall of faith, Jacob's in there. 
And Jacob was a notable figure, particularly that this well was placed in, there by him. It had some significance. But Jesus says, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. They'll be satisfied. I wonder if you've ever, like, had a craving for something. Maybe you, you really wanted a particular snack. And if you're anything like me, you go to the pantry, you open up the door, and you just stand in it. Where's what I want? And you're looking through every shelf, and you're like, no, I don't want that. Well, I guess I could. No, I don't want that. This, I don't want that. And we find that there's never really that snack that satisfies. Maybe you don't relate to that at all. Maybe I'm just hungry. But sometimes you go for their snack, you grab it, you eat it, and you go, yeah, that didn't do it. You're a little disappointed. Practically, what Jesus is talking about is that very same satisfaction. That sometimes we try to find peace. We try to make peace in this life. And we think, man, if I could just do this thing, I'd have peace. But Jesus brings us a tangible peace right now. And I want to tell you, you don't have to focus on the obstacles. The woman at the well goes, how are you going to get that water? You don't even have a bucket. How are you going to get it? There's nothing to draw the water with. Maybe you're thinking, Matthew, if you knew the current realities of my life, you would understand why I don't have peace. There's so much going on right now, there's not room in there for me to have peace. And I'm telling you, Jesus is bigger than the obstacles. And if you want this peace that Jesus offers, you don't have to look back to a past experience. The woman at the well points back to Jacob and says, look, our past, this well has satisfied our people for a long time. And I would say, hey, you don't have to look back to a prayer that you prayed when you were 13, 25, 41, whatever year you came to believe. You don't have to look back there and say, oh, i got to remember that peace. No, Jesus offers you a tangible peace right now, regardless of your circumstances, and regardless of when or how long ago you prayed that prayer. You don't need a previous prayer to give you this peace. You don't need a previous book or study. This peace that Jesus offers you right now is probably more than you might expect. See, the woman at the well, she was looking for just some basic water, in the midst of what feels like a chaotic situation that has called her life. Listen, man, I'm just trying to get some water. And Jesus wants to offer them, he in, injects himself and offers her something so much better. And I wonder if some of you have said something over the last few weeks that goes something like this. We just got to make it through Christmas. We just got to get through Christmas. We just got to get to the first of the year. We just got to get to spring. We just got to get to, through this next season of life. Maybe some of you have babies, and you're like, listen, we just got to get through the teething stage. We got to just get through potty training. Whatever season of life you're in, I wonder if you've said, we just need to get through. This woman was just looking to get water, but Jesus offers her something so much better. Look at verse 13. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I will not be thirsty, or have to come here to draw water. Isn't it funny, the thing that Jesus offers is satisfaction. To be satisfied. To be to the point where you don't need anything from this well. The truth that I know is true is that everyone is thirsty for peace. We all want to feel this peace inside us. We all want to have peace around us. We, want to, we just have this natural desire, that steadiness that we all crave, the kind of calm, when we say, man, we just need things to calm down, that kind of peace, we all crave it. And though we crave that peace, we live our lives in pursuits of the just. That's a funny word, in pursuit of the just. And what I mean by that is we say things like, I just need to blank and then things will settle down. I just need to get here. I just need to get this thing. I just need to go do this thing and then things will settle. I just need, I just, I just. And we always put one more thing in there and we fill in the blank of if I could just have that or do that or feel that, 
then I would be satisfied. But the problem is, all we're doing by pursuing the just is we're just going to the well in the middle of the day to get water, and inevitably, tomorrow we will be thirsty again. Oftentimes, we live our lives in regular rhythms that are devoid of the peace that is only found in Jesus. Because no matter if you get everything done on your to-do list, no matter if you earn enough money, no matter if you check off all those boxes or endure the seasons that you find yourself in, at the end of that to-do list is not peace. If that to-do list doesn't find us craving and depending on the water, the living water of Jesus Christ, then I'm, we're just going to find ourselves with another just that we need to do. See, Christmas is supposed to be all about Jesus bringing peace to us. But somehow we make it into this chaotic season of life that is completely void of peace. We make it about something else and hope that it will somehow still satisfy. I can't tell you how many times people are like, hey, listen, if we, once we get to Christmas, the family will be together, and it's just going to be so good, and all the craziness and pain and the struggles that we've been going to all through November and into December, will those just go away for this holiday? And the truth of the matter is they don't. The same problems that you have on December 22nd will be there for you on December 26th. You're just choosing to ignore them. But Jesus doesn't want that. He doesn't want you to just pursue these justs. He doesn't want you to have this hunger and thirst for more when you can be satisfied in him. But community life, I have to tell you, worldly peace, the things that you think will give you peace in this life, if they're not Jesus, they will never fully satisfy even if they satisfy you for a season, that satisfaction will run out. You will become hungry again. You will have more desires. Eventually, you will want more. But Jesus' peace satisfies. When we taste the living water that Jesus provides, it satisfies. And Jesus offers us a peace that is far bigger than our circumstances. Even in the worst moments of life, Jesus offers, a, offers us the peace of knowing that. A couple things, two things. He offers us the peace of knowing that first, nothing can separate you from the love of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. No matter what your circumstances is. I wonder how freeing that would be to the woman at the well if she just knew, listen, nothing can separate you from the love of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. If she would have known that how much peace she would have had rather than shame. The second thing is that you are a beloved child of God who is pleasing to him if you are in Christ Jesus. What a, pe what a peace that brings. And when you can live in the moment knowing with certainty that you are right now loved and accepted and pleasing to God, that provides you peace in the middle of your circumstances. That before you are anything else, if you have repented of your sins and put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are a beloved child of God. So when you recognize that, even in the worst moments, the same God is working all things out. We can say things like, God, you are great, so I don't have to be in control. Because you are ultimately in control. Sometimes the reason why our life is hectic is because we keep trying to grab the steering wheel rather than letting God be in control. We can say, God, you are great. I don't have to be in control. We can say things like, God, you are good. I don't have to look elsewhere for goodness. I don't have to try to tap into another well. God, you are the source of goodness. Let me be satisfied in you. We can say, God, you are glorious. I don't have to try to prove myself to anybody else because you already told me that I am loved and accepted. And if that's true, we don't need to try to prove ourselves to anybody else. And we can say, God, because you are gracious, I don't have to fear getting it wrong. The idea of giving up control, the idea of giving up needing to please other people, finding goodness in this world, or getting it wrong, if you could rid yourself of all those things, well, naturally you would have peace. So I want to tell you that even right now, in the middle of your circumstance, you can be satisfied with the peace of Jesus Christ, regardless of where, what you're going through. Look at verse 16 with me. It says, Jesus said to her, mind you, she said, oh, give me this water. And he says, okay, 
Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Here's my next point. Jesus offers us a peace that is bigger than our past successes or failures. I wonder if you can resonate at all with the woman at the well. Probably her worst sin that she feels on her heart, the thing that causes her the most shame, was just brought to light. You can almost sense her kind of challenging back at Jesus. Hey, yes, you said all those things. I perceive that you're a prophet. You know everything bad about me. But, you know, I would go to Jerusalem and worship, but, you know, I, you say I can't worship here, and only Jews are allowed there. The uncomfortable reality is that one of the biggest hindrances to our peace is your past. And the people who were around back then, or the people maybe who hurt you back then, one of the biggest hindrances to, to our peace is our past. And sometimes it's our past successes and our past failures. For this woman, her past failures in marriages with her husbands, her past failures and not feeling like she has a place to worship, all those things have hindered her from having real peace. Practically, sin gets in the way. And the enemy loves nothing more than pointing us back to saying, look how awful you were. Look at all the awful things that you did. And sometimes we can't help but try to carry those things around with us and it prevents us from having peace. But I think also sometimes our past successes get in the way of us having peace. Because we think that because we did X, Y, or Z, that that means that we're somehow good. And we're tapping into the well and asking the well of self-satisfaction to somehow provide us with peace. And the truth is it just won't. We're totally sometimes willing to throw out the negatives of our past, but we try to hold on to our excesses, our successes. But really, if we're going to tap into this peace that Jesus offers, we're going to have to lay down all of our previous baggage. I heard an analogy one time or a story that coming to Jesus is like there's this very tiny opening in a wall, and it's just enough for you. You can walk through it. But you can't bring your suitcase full of successes when you come to Jesus. It just doesn't fit. You don't get to bring those with you. But likewise, the suitcase and bag of your past sins and failures, when you come to Jesus, they don't fit either. You come just as you are, leave those behind, and we get to walk with Jesus. The only thing that we can bring to Jesus is our heart now. And what I want to tell you is you can trust how Jesus will handle your past. Look at what Jesus does to the woman at the well. The, women's, the woman's sinful past doesn't dictate how Jesus treats her. Jesus never treats her as a less than. He doesn't treat her in the way that she's afraid he's, that he's going to treat her. The reason she goes to the well is because in the middle of the day is because nobody else is going to be there. She's afraid that people are going to say things about her or to her or be mean. And Jesus steps right into the middle of her sinful, broken past and says, I see you. You have value. Now, don't get me wrong. Jesus doesn't ignore her sin. Jesus doesn't say, hey, it's totally okay that you lived your life in sin. He doesn't say that. But what he does say is that I will still come to you. You still have access to me. See, Jesus refuses to allow sin to dictate the relationship. Now, I have a practical application for you is that maybe you can allow the present peace that you have with G Jesus to dictate how you handle past hurts. The truth of the matter is at Christmas time, you find yourself around your family. And I'll tell you, in all my time of being a pastor so far, I've learned that the number one pain point for people is their family. Because that sometimes, that past family dealings are something that disrupts our peace right now. And I want to tell you that if you have repented of your sins, you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you can allow the present peace that he offers to dictate how you are going to respond to your family's past hurts. 
Practically, the people in your life who you least expect, Jesus can change, if Jesus can change your standing before God, well, he can change their standing before God as well. And I'm going to tell you something that's probably very unpopular. Other people's sin should not dictate how you are going to treat them. That's probably not very comfortable to think about. Just because other people have sinned against you, or have sins that you know of, doesn't mean that we should treat them as anything less than a child of God. Because Jesus goes to the person who nobody else would want to be around. I'm not saying that we should ignore sin. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we should totally say, hey, it's totally okay that this person in your life is living in sin. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying we should not allow their previous or current sin to dictate the relationship. We instead get to walk in peace. You don't have to prove yourself to your family. You don't have to prove yourself to your friends. You don't have to prove yourselves to anybody because God who is glorious has already declared something over you. He says you are a child of God. And if you're going to walk in that peace, if God who created the heavens and the earth, if God who created you, who creates life out of nothing, says that you are beloved, you are accepted, and you are pleasing, you can have peace in the middle of your chaotic family. You could step in and say, it's going to be hectic, but I get to tap into the peace that I have in Jesus, and I get to display that peace. Because my mom, my dad, my sister, my brother, my grandma, my uncle, whoever doesn't dictate who I am, God does. And then you get to give away peace. Because could the person who gives you the most frustration at Christmas, could that be the person who desperately needs the cup of living water that you have? Could the way that you respond to the difficult people in your life provide peace to those who desperately need it. Jesus offers us a peace that is far bigger than our past successes or failures, and Jesus offers us a peace that is far bigger than their past successes and failures, whoever the they is in your life. Look at verse 21 with me. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming where neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Here's my third point. Jesus offers us a peace that is fueled by and produces worship. There's a funny line in the middle of that section where it says salvation is from the Jews. Historically, if you look in the Old Testament, God's people were the Jews, the Israelites. And the scandal of the gospel that Jesus is getting ready to unveil for everybody is that the gospel is for everyone, not just the Jews. Jesus is saying there's come as a time where it ain't going to matter where you worship. What's going to matter is what you believe. He says it matters about spirit and in truth. But he says that salvation is from the Jews. That's because the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, would come through the Jews. And that Messiah would be the one who would redeem all of creation. So that's what that little bit's about. But what about that stuff about spirit and in truth? It says we are to worship in spirit and in truth. Well, we all like truth. But can I tell you, believing just the right things isn't really enough. Here's an uncomfortable truth. Even the demons believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Even the demons believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. Even the demons believe that he has done miracles and has a lot of power. But the difference is they don't walk in belief that Jesus is their Savior. They have not repented of sins and put their faith in Jesus Christ. They do not worship him. To worship in spirit and truth is to not only declare that things are true, but to believe them at our heart level. To say, no, I believe and I depend on, I find my peace, my hope, and my joy in Jesus Christ. Walking in the spirit of what is true. Look at Romans 8, 5, and 6. It'll be on the screen. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit set their minds on things of the spirit. 
For to set the, thing, set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. What I want for you is to keep one foot out of this world. Do you know that as good as your life may be here on earth, if you are in Christ, you have a whole life to come that is far better. You are a citizen of heaven. So I want you to keep one foot in the world to come. This is not your home. And when we choose to live with this, this way, setting our mind on the things above, setting our mind on who Jesus is and, and who God is, the byproduct of that is worship. When you recognize what Jesus has done for you, the only natural response is worship. When we think of this peace, this is what we, this is what we do is we worship. When we realize that we do not deserve this peace that Jesus offers us, when we recognize that it's been freely given to us, that should produce in us a grateful heart. And grateful hearts worship. And what's interesting is it says that God, Jesus says God is looking for people to worship him in spirit and in truth. He's looking for that. He desires that. You were created to worship God. And what's funny is the crazy thing is when you feel like your life is feel, filled with anything but peace, the remedy to that problem is worship. The remedy to the chaos of our lives is worshiping Jesus more. Remembering who you are in relation to God helps bring you peace. Remembering who God is in relation to your situation brings us peace. When we remember that God is great, we don't have to be in control. That should spur us to worship. When we remember that God is good, we don't have to look elsewhere. That, res that gives us peace and we can worship. When we remember that God is gracious, we don't have to fear getting it wrong. We worship. And when we recognize that God is glorious, we don't have to prove ourselves. All those things should produce in us peace. And when we worship, we're declaring those things. This worship fuels in us a spirit of peace. So the truth is, if you don't have peace, you should probably go worship God. And worshiping God, if you don't have peace, you should worship God. And if you do have peace, you should probably worship God. And let me tell you, worship isn't just singing, but it is at least singing. It's not just singing, but it's at least singing. Worship is giving God the glory in our words, our actions, and in our heart. And in, let me tell you, it is worshipful to sing. It is worshipful to serve Him. It is worshipful to give. It's worshipful to do all these things if in our heart is our desire to glorify God. Worship is just glorifying God in what we do. Jesus then goes, or in verse 25 it says this, the woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who you speak to am he. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a wom this woman, but no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. When the disciples come back, it says that they marveled that Jesus was talking to this woman. Even to the people, even to the people that we wouldn't go to, Jesus goes. To the people that we would never dare dream, talk to, or associate with, Jesus is for them. To the people that we see hard or difficult, Jesus goes to them. To the people who are ashamed or downhearted or heavy-hearted, Jesus goes to them. And what a freeing thing for this woman to hear when Jesus says, this man who you are talking to, I am he. Jesus says, I am the Christ. In order to provide a peace that fuels worship, and in order to provide a peace that is bigger than our current circumstances, and in order to provide a peace that is bigger than our past failures or successes, he would have to be somebody special. And he is. Jesus is the Christ. 
The reason why peace is so good is because peace is in contrast to war. We have to recognize that naturally we are at war with God. Our passions and our desires don't naturally align with God. And God being the creator, sustainer, perfecter, God being a good judge, it is right that he would punish us for that. It is right that we would see, receive his wrath for that. And to have our relationship completely re- estranged from God, Romans 3.23 says it like this, that all, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And listen, the punishment for falling short of the glory of God is an eternity estranged from God that we call hell. That's what we deserve because we're naturally in rebellion to God. But John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. The reason why Jesus offers us peace, or how Jesus offers us peace, is through his own life. Jesus willingly dies a death that we deserve on a cross, takes on all that wrath of God. So that we get to Romans 8.1 that says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This peace that Jesus offers us is a right standing before our Creator. That no matter what we've done, where we came from, what we're going through, or what we will go through, we are a beloved child of God. So what do I practically want you to do? Jesus started by saying, woman, if you knew who you were talking to and who was asking you to give, you wa- give him water, you would ask him to give you water, living water. Church, I want you to ask for it. I want you to ask Jesus for this peace. That if you are not a believer, if you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, I want you to ask him for that peace. Because I bet you, you are hungry for peace. That you're tired of your situation. You desire to, for this to be a peace over your life. Jesus has it. Ask him for the peace. And then I want you to receive it. Maybe you've already asked for it, but maybe you need to get better at receiving. Here's the thing about the gift of peace. Gifts are given, they are not earned. If you have to earn something, that's called a wage. The gift that Jesus offers us is, in fact, a gift. He gave it to you out of love. It'd be awful if our, my kids came downstairs on Christmas. There was this present for them. And I said, oh, that gift? You got to go do chores to get that gift. That's not a gift. That's a wage. Jesus doesn't say that. He says, ask me for the living water. And I'll give it to you. And then all you have to do is take it. And then the last thing I want you to do is I want you to give that peace away. Ask for that peace. Receive that peace. Walk in that peace. Worship in that peace. Sometimes worship to get that peace. And then once you have that peace, I want you to give it. Because everyone is looking for peace. Everyone is asking, can this be the Christ? Maybe it's not those words, but they're wondering, hey, is there something to this Christmas stuff? Is there something to all those people gathered on Christmas Eve talking about the manger? Everybody's asking, give that peace away because once you have received it you share it with someone else and then they'll have living water as well let's pray heavenly father i thank you so much for your peace i I don't know a better way to say it that despite the heaviness of my sin the things that i've done to create a gap between my relationship between me and you father you sent jesus to bridge that gap That Jesus in my place for my sin means that I have peace with you. And because I have peace with you, I can have peace with others. I can have peace in the middle of my circumstances. I can have peace with my past. Because when you came to the cross, when you sent Jesus to the cross, you knew the sins that I was going to commit before I ever committed them. And for the people in this room, Father, you're painfully aware of their situation. So, Father, I help, I pray that you would move in these people, that they would be able to ask for the peace, to say, Jesus, I desperately need that peace. And, Father, they would receive it, not trying to earn it, not trying to barter for it, but they would just take it and walk in the peace of knowing that you say they are beloved. You say they are a child of God. And for anyone who's in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation, and that is peace. And so, Father, if there's somebody in the room who does not yet know you, I pray they would ask for it and receive it. And then, Father, let us be a people like the woman on the well 
whose circumstances were completely changed by Jesus, goes out and tells others. Let that be true of us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.